set to launch a last-ditch attempt to reach a consensus on the final day of the UN climate summit in Copenhagen. But with much bickering between rich and poor nations during nearly two weeks of talks, many doubt a new deal will be sealed. Well, we can cross live now to our correspondent in Copenhagen, Anissa Nawe. Uh, Anissa, the last day of the conference, and it seems there's been little progress on the major issues. Are they likely to be able to turn it around by the end of the day? That's right. We're really coming into the final hours of the Copenhagen Climate Change Summit, and it's looking more and more like we're not going to see a binding treaty between the 200 or so nations taking part. However, there are over 100 leaders here for the so-called wrap-up of the summit, including Presidents Dmitry Medvedev and U.S. President Barack Obama. Now, the U.S. has already said it will try to mobilize $100 billion in climate aid by 2020 for poorer nations, for developing countries, to help them them make those emissions cuts. And the Russian president has already urged biggest, the biggest countries, the world's richest nations, to assume equal obligations when it comes to responsibility, also adding that pressure shouldn't be put on developing nations, on poorer countries, to make pledges which exceed their economic capabilities. And that's really been one of the main sticking points. Uh, one of them has been specific numbers, agreeing to specific numbers when it comes to emissions cuts, and also uh, the debate between poorer and richer nations. Uh, it's been a long-standing debate when it comes to climate, and poor nations are very angry that they're being pressured to take on so much responsibility when they feel it was the West, the richer countries, uh, that, that did most of the damage, really. And this has been a debate that has been going on for years, and certainly over the past two weeks. In fact, it got so heated during negotiations uh, that the negotiations were halted several times, specifically because of this issue. And that debate is likely going to continue, because like I said, we're not expecting a binding treaty. We are expecting some kind of roadmap framework, which will take us through the next year, most likely to Mexico, where another climate change summit will be held. Uh, Anissa, President Dmitry Medvedev signed a climate doctrine for Russia before heading to the conference. Uh, what measures did it outline for the country to tackle climate change? Well, again, when it comes to climate, there seems to be a lot of discussion about balance. And what this doctrine really focuses on is, for Russia at least, to find the balance between ecology and the economy. Um, so basically, it's a plan that is a way for Russia specifically to protect the environment but not slow economic development. Most specifically, it deals with raising efficiency of, uh, of the Russian economy by 40 percent by 2020. Let's take a look now, though, at details more specifically. To cut carbon emissions, Russia will take the following steps. Raise the industrial efficiency of the economy. Develop renewable and alternative energies. Implement financial and tax policies to cut greenhouse gases. The sensible use of wood and the creation of sustainable forests. Now, President Dmitry Medvedev is expected to address the summit here in Copenhagen. He's expected to outline his views on the way the world should work together to fight climate change. Uh, but even before this summit began, there was a lot of scandal surrounding it. It really pushed it into the spotlight, both for supporters and skeptics. And as my colleague Laura Emmett reports, the scandal hasn't quite stopped yet. This cherry-picking and misrepresenting data isn't anything new, according to those opposed to the summit in Copenhagen. There was the famous hockey stick diagram produced by somebody called Mann, which purported to show that for the last thousand years, temperature had been fairly steady before suddenly going up very, very rapidly. But it's now been shown that any set of figures can be manipulated in the way Mann's system did to produce the hockey stick diagram. The British Met Office's Hadley Centre and the University of East Anglia's Climate Research Unit jointly run the climate database. Elements of it were made public in order to diffuse the recent row over leaked emails. But a study by the Moscow-based Institute of Economic Analysis shows the Hadley Centre used statistics from weather stations in Russia that fitted its theory on global warming and ignored those that didn't. There are certain forces in the world that are against the climate paradigm. Many people are saying that in the current fight for the climate, there's more politics, economy and finance than struggle for ecology. Recent events indicate that the struggle for influence over this ecological beating has started. 
The institute claims only 25% of the Russian data was used by the Hadley Center. That means 40% of Russia's territory is unrepresented in the world's most important temperature record, and not because there are no weather stations. The analysis also shows the UK Met Office favoured incomplete statistics from Russia and used data from urban weather stations rather than rural ones. This new scandal surrounding climate change science doesn't seem to have diverted the juggernaut that is the Copenhagen Carbon Emissions Summit. It's careering towards its final moments, and the only topic under discussion here is whether or not any kind of meaningful deal will be signed. It's looking less and less likely, and some Russian skeptics suggest that's a good thing for the country. This scare story kills two birds with one stone. It makes money and limits Russia's presence on the European market. The logic is simple. Global warming is the main threat facing the world. The main reason for global warming is carbon emission. And the main source of carbon emission is fossil fuels, oil and gas. And Russia is the leading exporter of oil and gas in Europe and in the world. It could also be a good thing for the rest of the world. Even the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change admits that a temperature rise of not more than three degrees would increase world food production. Laura Emmett, RT, Copenhagen. Now, like Laura said, there is a lot of pessimism about a binding treaty. Nevertheless, skeptics and supporters are highly anticipating this final declaration, which is expected later on today. Also on the sidelines, President Dmitry Medvedev said to meet with U.S. President Barack Obama. Topping that agenda, well, on December 5th, the U.S. and Russia were meant to sign a new strategic arms reduction treaty, and that didn't happen. We were told it was going to happen before the new year, but it's not looking like that is going to be the case just on Thursday, Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov saying that it is the U.S. side which is halting talks. Apparently, they can't agree on the number of nuclear stockpiles they're going to uh, reduce in that treaty. Uh, but it is expected that Obama and Medvedev will certainly speak about this. And if, um, if they speak to us after, which is unlikely, we might be able to hear when we could possibly see a new uh, so-called START treaty. OK, a lot of important issues to get through, of course. Uh, Nisanawe, live from Copenhagen for us for now. Thank you.